But shortly thereafter, the Lord sent a, a, a tornado and, uh, and, 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 it, and it basically provided him almost an 80% reef uh, for, on the home. So the home is about, you know, eight times uh, worth more now than it was when I stayed in it. So, so if you'd like for me to come, uh, uh, if, if you live in the Northeast, if you want me to drive by your home with us, uh, uh, I would catch here some uh, neat, neat service of Jesus. Christ and how he's involved in a very neat city. He has a team member with him uh, today. But uh, these city stories uh, have really shaped and helped the City Impact Roundtable over these 15 years. Uh, a lot of best practice ideas, a lot of inspiration, a lot of resourcing has come about. Because a lot of new city reaching efforts. So, uh, these are all time presentations. They know that uh, uh, so that's part of our process. Uh, because everybody is important, everybody's time is, is important, uh, the numbers are going to be different on your sheet because we are changing up just a few things. But presenters, just please know the amount of time that you've been given, uh, it hasn't changed. It hasn't, certainly hasn't gotten any more. Um, yeah. <laughs> it can't be less. Uh, he'll introduce Brother John, dear brother's friend that I've really grown to really appreciate a whole lot. Appreciate his heart. He's uh, super smart, uh, very humble, and uh, I think you'll be blessed by this time. Uh, would you welcome uh, folks from Branson, please? Thank you. So, I'm going to say what Jarvis just said is um, our house was not the same for eight months after Jarvis was there. Uh, it took us eight months to recover, and uh, we finally got furniture last week, so it's a big deal. Um, let me say, how, how many of you have ever been to Branson, Missouri? Let me just see hands. Whoa, John, that's impressive. You join seven million other people a year to come to join us. Uh, so you understand that we are not a big city, but we have a lot of people that come to visit. We have seven million visitors a year. However, uh, our population is less than 10,000. Uh, our entire county is less than 40,000. Those guys from New York, you have more people in a city block than we have in our entire county. Uh, so there's a, a big stretch here. And so we hope that uh, as we share today, uh, not only will, for those of you that are from more rural applications, will gain from it, but we hope that our conversation is high enough in the concepts of principle and process that uh, uh, no matter what size of of uh, village or city you come from, that you'll be able to find some applications. I wanted to say a couple words about John Baltus before he came up. Uh, John is the director for the Silver Dollar City Foundation in Branson, Missouri. He was general uh, manager for Silver Dollar City for many years before that. Uh, and uh, prior to that, he was in San Diego with SeaWorld as a manager there. and. Um, he has a huge heart for hearing the heart of God. He has a listening spirit to listen to the heart of God. And um, he has built solid relationships with spiritual leaders in our community. And uh, it's just a great honor and a great joy to tag along with him in a lot of different ways. So welcome my friend John Hall. One of the things that we have is a premise, and this started about seven, eight years ago. We began to recognize that Christ is the builder in our community. And that simple little phrase doesn't mean a lot until you begin to take hold of that and you begin to see that we feel that Christ was the builder in our past. We feel that Christ is the builder now. And because of that, we see Christ being the builder in our future. So we're really here to let me, I just want to share with you how, why we believe that and give you some very tangible examples of what we see being demonstrated that have convinced us that Christ is the builder in our community. Now, before I share with you just exactly what those words mean, Christ is the builder, I want to clearly state up front, our community has its problems. We have domestic violence. We have families in poverty. We have drug abuse. We have issues. Our community is not a refuge for shattered lives. I do not want to communicate that. But like other communities, we are dealing with disturbing issues. But the fact is, it's not that we have problems. It's now how we've chosen to go about solving those problems. And once we made the commitment to say Christ is the builder, 
Now he's in the solutions, in the things we do moving forward. It's not us. It's not our ministries. It's not our churches. He is that builder. So what's important now in solving that is that if what we're going to be doing is we are now very intentional about ensuring Christ is the builder. Now, when we start out, we're saying it's important to understand your culture, the culture in your community. So it's not about us. Look in your past. Look back 50 years, 100 years, 150, 200. Depending on where you are, your culture is going to tell you a lot about what's going on in your own community today. Now, a culture is defined by what the... Okay, if you have an organization, the culture in your organization is simply defined by what the people in that organization value. And what they value is going to be reflected in their actions. Okay, so here's the point. If you have a church or a ministry, your culture is divided in that church, is defined in that by what you value. And if what you value in your church or your ministry is Christ-like behavior, then you'll see that in the actions. Now, cities are nothing more than organizations. So cities have a culture, all right? And it is defined or guided by what the residents in that city value. And if we value Christ as the builder in our community, you should be able to see it in our actions. That's the connection. So, if it's going to, again, it's important to understand that there's a movement of God in your community. What we've just said is you'll see it in your culture, you'll see it in your values, and you'll see it in your actions. See, God doesn't do anything just superficially. You can't just use his names. You should be able to see evidence that he is immersed in your actions. Therefore, he's immersed in the things you value. And therefore, it should be immersed in your culture. So once we made that connection, we decided that we're just going to take a look at our history. We're going to look to the past and see what did those who went before us value. What do we see in their behavior that now gives us an indication of what they valued at the time. So, what we saw when we look back in our history were people inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was just that evident to us. If you have ever read Shepherd of the Hills by Harold Bell Wright, you cannot deny that Christ wasn't present in those hills when that man walked those hills and wrote that book at the turn of the century. If you go forward 20 years, there was a little high school started then called School of the Ozarks. It is a fully flourishing college today, and it is called the College of the Ozarks. And when you know that history, you see the movement of the Holy Spirit in those hills. Anybody here of Guy Howard? He happens to be the walking preacher of the Ozarks. He wrote a book about the Ozark Hills, and that was in the 30s. And when you read his story, Movement of the Holy Spirit in Christ was clearly in the hills then. We've had something in our community for almost 60 years called Adoration Parade. Started in the late 40s. It still exists today and it is sponsored by the city of Branson. Catch that? An Adoration Parade in the city of Branson for almost 60 years now. It's in our culture, it's in our history. Something called Silver Dollar City. If you don't know that story, 50 years ago, the Hershens moved there from Chicago, started a little thing called Silver Dollar City, went on the Beverly Hillbillies in the mid-60s, and the rest is history. That park today is doing oh, two, two and a half million people a year, and they have a very bold statement about where Christ fits in their community and in their company. And then there's something that started in the mid-90s that most people don't know about yet. It was a prayer movement. Something called Uninterrupted Prayer Team. Something called uh, Community Businessmen's... Uh, Christian Businessmen's... What's that, Howard? Christian Businessmen's... Anyway, the Pastor's Prayer Summit, Mayor's Prayer Breakfast. Here's what we've learned. By looking at our past, we saw a culture inspired by the Holy Spirit. And here's the key. 
we discovered three things that all of those people had in common as you look over the first 60 years in our community. And I'm just, for the lack of going to say it, it's the importance of our spiritual leaders. Here were the three spiritual traits that we identified that flowed through all of those folks. Number one is these people knew and understood God's purpose. See, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, I knew you before you were born. I consecrated you in your mother's womb. That means he has set aside people for a holy purpose. We are set aside for a holy purpose. Those people were set aside for a holy purpose. And I appointed you. He's got a plan. He's got a plan for us. He's got resources for us. He's got resources. He's got gifts. He's got talents. And so what that means is that God has spiritually mature individuals who have his delegated authority in spiritual domain in our cities. You go back and look at the walking preacher of the Ozark. You look at Harold Bell Wright. They were spiritually mature, passionate people who were there because God appointed them to be there at that time. Here's the second trait, God's vision. These people saw what God saw. And you can do that if you're a spiritually mature person. The person is passionate about the cause, not the organization. God puts it on their heart and they are passionate about what they're doing. And so God has, God allows these people to see circumstances through his eyes. That's what's going on. That is the kind of character traits these people had turn of the century through the first half of this century. In other words, these people see things through the eyes of God's heart. That's how they see their community. And then the third thing was spiritual platform. God's platform. See, so talk about Nehemiah earlier. When Nehemiah was rebuilding the church, he was building it with rocks and stones. Today, we're built, Christ is rebuilding his cities with living stones. But the process is still the same. Christ is the builder. Christ is doing the building. It's just that he's doing that with us instead of rocks and stones. So here's the point. What God is doing is he is providing spiritual platforms for those people that he has chosen to be his delegated authority in those communities where you, excuse me, you have been assigned, we have been assigned. Now, in the past, here were the spiritual platforms. They were a novel. They were a school. They were an autobiography. They were a parade. They were a theme park. They were a variety of things, but they had a spiritual purpose. See, I just read on the surface, Harold Bell Wright wrote a novel. Guy Howard wrote an autobiography. The guy that discovered and started the School of the Ozarks, he had a school. The Hershians had a theme park. But you can't get hung up on what you tangibly see because God had a spiritual happening occurring at that time around those physical things that he had in the community. So here's the bottom line of all of that and why that history is so important. The evidence that Christ is the builder in a city is there are spiritually mature, passionate people with pure hearts who see what God sees and who have a spiritual platform that allows others to join him in his work. In other words, when you see that behavior through a person in your community, you can bet that God has assigned them there. God has a purpose for them. We are learning from the past on what to look for when people surface in our community and say, hey, I have this idea. And when they're behaving like these people are behaving, we listen. Because we believe God has them there for a purpose. And we have a responsibility to be collaborative in helping that person get started on whatever God has called them to do in that community. Now, what I'd like to do is ask Howard to just share with you some of the current examples of why we believe Christ is the builder in our community today. So let's just back up for just a moment and address those uh, two or three items just to show you um, Silver Dollar City as an example. Um, employees and former employees are often found walking the park doing prayer walks, praying for safety, praying for people to not get hurt, praying for jobs to be maintained, praying for the people to have a good time. Uh, all of those things, it's a, it, it's a spiritual place. 
and there's lots of Christian things that go on. But when uh, the 1st of November rolls around, like right now, it's in a big changeover. And now that will turn in the sing to the single greatest evangelistic uh, exposure to the gospel for, mil for a million or more people until the end of the year. Because the message of Jesus Christ and how he came and what he done is included in everything that's done. It's in your face how much Jesus Christ loves you. And uh, it's just an incredible thing. College of the Ozarks. Um, every student that graduates there with a four-year degree is graduating debt-free. In our culture today, to graduate from a, a, a high, end, a, it, ours is hard, arguably one of the hardest schools in the United States to get into. I traveled to Israel with the president of the college a few years ago, and we had some great discussions. It's literally as hard to get in there as it is any Ivy League school. The standards are huge, and every student graduates debt-free. Is that incredible? We could go on and on with it. The Adoration Parade, incredible. You can't even have a float that just has secular stuff on it. You can have your name on it, but the message of the float has to be spiritual. You can have Santa Claus as long as he's worshiping Jesus. You know, you can have a fire truck as long as there's a recognition that Christ is our protection. Does that make sense? So I just want to add a few little glimpses to, to those things that he's saying. So a few short years ago, I can't remember exactly, three or four years ago, God put it in my heart that pastors within our city, and I am one, needed to recognize the valid pastoral positions that business people in our community were carrying as well, who were Christian people, who were doing the ministry of pastoring and caring for the lives of people in their businesses or at the school or at, the, uh, at a manufacturing plant or at a, whatever it was, entertainment venue, a theater. Those people had, their ministry was as viable and as, as important in the kingdom of God as any pastor that stood behind the pulpit. So I approached this with the pastors from our pastor's prayer summit group. And um, as we talked about it, it took a little while to work through it, took two or three meetings, but eventually they, we came around to that idea. And it was very cool how that all happened. Um, actually, it was so cool. Phil was there, help, Phil Milliard was there helping us process, and I stepped out of the room to go do some other stuff, and while they were talking, they all decided that that was true while I was out of the room. I thought that was just absolutely incredible. Sometimes God moves in ways that we could never make it happen. But what was cool about it is that we put out an invitation into 50 some, I think it was 56 or 7, of the spiritual leaders in our community who were, who, uh, uh, who were not pastors. And out of 58, we had 47 show up for a meeting. I had a man in that's an insurance man, largest insurance company in our city, who has grown up, born and raised in that area, who came to me with tears. He said, Howard, he said, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure I understand why you have invited me, an insurance guy, to come to a spiritual influencer's meeting. I don't see where I'm doing that. And I began to give him the picture that had been conveyed to me about how many different people in his insurance business and throughout the community have been highly influenced by him. He is a spiritual influence. And those people will respond if you give them the opportunity to do so. I also, we were talking in City Reaching about the value of setting some measurement tools, setting some kind of a, a spot where we could see statistically through research and statistics that we were growing in spirituality within our community. You can judge dollars by taxes or by profit margins and all those things, but you can't judge spiritual growth in those same measures. So how do we do that? Well, we, we the Mission America group was working on some stuff, and they had a pollster who was willing to do it, but it was going to be like $22,000. We didn't have $22,000 to do it. And so I went Silver Dollar City's statistical expert, 
And I said, hey, this is what I'd like to do, and here's 30 questions we'd like to use. What would it take, and what would it cost? And the end result was um, we were able to hire a professional to train a group from a not-for-profit on how to make the professional phone calls. So the money we would have spent for professionals to do all that went to the not-for-profit instead of to a secular business. And then we turned around and we were able to have hire that person to simply do the analysis uh, instead of all the other things re regarding the information. And so we got, to, for less than $4,000, we were able to set a, an idea of where our standard is so that we can come back five years from then and redo that same thing and say, have we improved spiritually? Have we matured spiritually? But along the way, we discovered some great statistical information that's helped us to make wise decisions about gatherings and events and process within our community. In terms of not only uh, spiritual people as such, but spiritual platforms, ways in which the work of God and the activity of God in the community begins to take shape, begins to take on flesh. So, um, Silver Dollar City Foundation actually was uh, cre the creators of the Care for Kids program, which is a, a marrying of relationship between churches and schools. Schools need volunteers. Schools recognize the need for high quality, character developing, readers, lunch buddies, all those kinds of things. And if the church is willing to serve, there's no limit to what you can do when you go in as a servant. And so, so through the Care for Kids program, we've been able to, the Silver Dollar City organization, invest in, what's the total on that investment, John, that Silver Dollar City has put in over a five-year time period? The company's been very blessed. We've been able to give out $700,000 over the last seven years to the 14 school districts in a two-county area. $700,000, for those of you might not have heard, $700,000 to 14 school districts over the last seven years. Seven for years. one purpose, help meet the physical needs of kids. Here's the point. They can't spend their money, but if a kid is cold and hungry, that's going to interfere with school. So we said, we'll partner with you. You do what you do best, teach the kids. We'll help you get the kids up to where their health and their well-being is at a higher level so they function better. That was the point. That's and the, the church came along and said, if you, don't, you, you can't buy enough help to do that, but we can get volunteers to come and do that, and you can use those dollars as they're intended for the well-being of the children, and so that all those things that don't get done with, with school dollars can be done to help kids. And then there was a program that years ago uh, we hosted a... Um, yeah, that's a whole long story. That would take three hours to go there. Let me back up. Uh, a number of years ago, our, our city boomed because of a Good Morning America interview with Mel Tillis. And everybody in the U.S. thought they could make $6 million a year if they just moved to Branson. And uh, so they picked up and they moved to Branson. And we had people living under, uh, under bridges and in the woods and in tents and all that kind of stuff. That all works well. People come from all over the U.S. to live in campers during the summertime. Doesn't work so well in December in Branson or January or February. So there was a need for housing. So we, we got into some temporary housing. Our church became a, a homeless shelter. Out of that, when we ended that after three years, we helped create a loaves and fishes program. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because of timing. Sometimes you move into something and it's the timing is right, and then it moves and it floats around, and then it comes back in again because the time is right. This past year, Loaves and Fishes, which is not an authorized 501c3, but is able to be funded through the National Christian Foundation local branch office there in Branson, of which I'm the president, <laughs> they were able to be funded the little bit that they needed to help with a few odds and ends, about $3,000 for some paper goods. We just helped funnel the money for them. But I want you to hear what, what was being done. There were between eleven and 12,000 people 
who were served meals every day of the week for 72 days. Seven churches provided the facilities and businesses, families, Bible study groups, school classes, on and on the list went, put together a team of 12 to 20 people who would buy the food, cook the food, serve the food, clean up the kitchen, clean up the fellowship hall of the churches that we used, and we served uh, close to 300 people per night during that, during that time period when we're in the middle of the winter. Now, that's important because it shows to us that it doesn't take a half a million dollar budget to feed people who are hungry. Because people who have food in their cupboard want to share with people who don't have a cupboard to put food in. If we give them the opportunity, we have one night, spread out the information throughout the community, come to this location, we'll have a calendar on the wall, you sign up for the one night you'll be responsible to do. 72 nights were filled within 30 minutes in a meeting. And then for three, nearly three months, all of the organizational stuff goes on, and it happens without us even knowing what the actual cost was. But some people want to donate, so we channel a few thousand dollars through to help take care of paper goods. Is that awesome? <laughs> but, you know, there's what we call catalyst groups in our community. These catalyst groups are specific about um, pulling together a group of individuals who are willing to become engaged without becoming used up. A catalyst, by definition, is something that increases the rate of reaction without being consumed in the process. So how does that work? Find spiritually mature, passionate people with pure hearts who see what God sees and who have God's delegated authority for a specific activity that He wants to do in the community and they tend to have spiritual dominion or leadership for that area. If they'll come together regularly, and if those meetings will include prayer and really a demonstration of business-mindedness to where things aren't bogged down in committees and to where things don't get done, that's the problem with the church is we have a tendency to talk a lot and get very little done. And that's why a lot of businessmen shy away from working through those things is because they're used to getting things done. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? Okay, so what's happened with that? Well, we had a group of people who said, if we're going to do things here in our community, we're going to have to have funds to get them done. We're going to have to have some money. Well, the problem with Christianity is we have a tendency to not make giving attractive or convenient. And so consequently, large sums of money out of your city are going, that God intended for you to have to minister to the people in your city, are flowing out of your city to help build new university buildings or put a new name on a, on a football field or whatever those kinds of things are. Those are all good things, but it's not the activity God intended for that money to go for. So we got a hold eventually of the National Christian Foundation and we developed a branch office in Branson and we have a generosity council that meets and we consider working together to make it possible to have greater amounts of funding for the work of God in our community. Because if we do that well, we'll have enough to share with other communities as well. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, other most parts of the earth. Our Faith Community Health Center. We have low-waged workers, service industry, hotel workers, restaurant workers, on and on. And most of the employers do not provide, cannot financially provide for health insurance. So we came along and through a series of gatherings of catalyst group-minded people, people coming around to pray and plan around common need, they eventually identified the Faith Community Health Center in Branson. We were uh, provided some facilities. We remodeled those facilities. We have, we, and we are just uh, about three years into the process. 
And God is doing amazing things to touch the lives of the uninsured workers in the Branson area. John, come back and talk to us about the Ozark Mountain Legacy Initiative for a few moments. Very quickly, somebody asked us. Catch the picture. If we look to our past, got a glimpse of what Christ as the builder looks like in our past. We looked in our present, which is what Howard just described, caught a glimpse of what it looks like when Christ is the builder in, your in our community. Then we got on to the obvious idea. We need to be intentional going forward to make sure Christ is the builder. We did three things, which coming to your table right now is something called Ozark Mountain Legacy. We got together and started out with 16 people in a room. We identified what we thought were the values of our area. We went out and spoke with 400 people in our community in uh, what we'll call town hall meetings. We solidified the input. We got professionals to come in to help us facilitate the statement that you have in front of you. So the vision is we're very intentional of making sure that we protect and pass on the values of our area. The backside, it says, you know what, if you live and behave this way for the next 10 years, what's your community going to look like? What's our community going to look like? That's what you have in front of you. We are now started and launched this year something called the Legacy Youth Institute. Catch this. We went to the eight school districts in our two-county area. We said, superintendents, will you let two to four juniors out of school during the day so they can come to a meeting and meet with the leaders in our community firsthand. And what were the five values that we said we wanted to set aside five Wednesdays for? Family, faith, family, friends, family, faith, friends, flag, and future. In other words, we're saying if we're going to be intentional about making sure our values get handed off to the generations behind us, we better start behaving that way. That is where you find the Legacy Youth Institute. We're being very intentional now of starting in school and bringing them along to the values in their community so they feel like it's their community. And the last thing that we have going is we have finally decided that there are some things in our community that other people might like to learn how to do. So we, in fact, later a year from now, will start out a lab school and having people come into Branson if they choose to, just to learn what Christ is doing in our community and seeing if it might have some application in their community. So we recognize that we are not, we don't have all the answers. We know that what we've been given doesn't belong to us. Christ has given that to us. And so whatever he's provided, we're wanting to share that with others that would like to learn what that is and what its application is. So, if I had to say what is our dream, when we started out to do this Branson Lab School, we said, you know what? We do think that God has chosen us to be a city on a hill. We do think He has chosen us to be a light to a nation. And it's because we recognize He's chosen every city to be a city on a hill. He's chosen every community, every city to be light to a nation. Because when you put those lights in one place, this nation is now a light to the world. And that is what our dream is. And we are just one very small part of what he is orchestrating in all of these communities that are represented here today. And I'm just pleased we have a chance to be a part of that. So as final takeaways, I just threw uh, these things up for you to think about. Um, you know, the principles do not change from city to city. The process adjusts culturally but it's fully dependent upon God's timing and obedient ears. That's just it. And then the application, it has to be practical. What is going to work in uh, San Francisco or Sacramento is not the thing that's going to work in Branson. What's going to work in Pearl, Mississippi is not the thing that's going to work in New York City, right? So those concepts, the, it, the application has to be localized and it has to be practical, it has to be fully contextualized. And then I think that the one thing that we do not do well 
is uh, we have a tendency to shoot the arrow and then go paint the target around it. We, and then pat ourselves on the back with how close we got to the middle. And what we really need is to be brutally honest with ourselves about how are we doing in being the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and what's standing in our way and how do I need to change my own behaviors in order to get a few more people around me to catch the same thing and so that the love of Jesus is seen in it all. Jarvis?